Our first speaker is Andrew von Prague. He's a field application scientist for Bruker Biospin out of Massachusetts. Well, <coughs> I hope everyone had a good lunch. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And as Dr. Hicks mentioned, uh, I, I'm a field application scientist from Bruker Molecular Imaging, which is a subdivision of Bruker Biospin. Sorry, I, you need to stand by the Ah, very good. Field of view. Um, very good. And <coughs> we're headquartered up in Berwicka, Mass. And today's very brief seminar is going to essentially highlight two of the image devices that Bruca provides for non invasive, in vivo preclinical imaging. The Albira is a PET, SPEC, and CT, and or CT imager, trimodal. The uh, in vivo extreme and its progenitor, the MSFX Pro, lab bench version versus uh, standalone uh, being the extreme, both do optical imaging, fluorescence and luminescence, high resolution digital x ray, and radioisotopic imaging. So, seven imaging modalities within two devices. Uh, a quick um, view of uh, Bruker from a high level. Uh, founded in 1960, over 5,000 employees were um, a very diversified uh, life sciences technology provider. Headquartered in Bruker, as I mentioned, but with research facilities and sales facilities worldwide. Now, Bruker has basically four subdivisions. Uh, I am from the Bruker Biospin uh, division, which uh, provides both MRI and micro CT. And within Bruker Biospin, there is Bruker Molecular Imaging, and we bring, uh, as a subdivision of the subdivision, seven additional imaging modalities already outlined. Okay, so again, the focus will be on the Albera and the In Vivo Extreme. Here's a quick peek inside the Albera. <coughs> It basically consists of a lead shielded trimodal uh, modular construct with a 10 and a half centimeter gantry for the mouse or the animal management system, okay? And it can handle one, four, um, or one, uh, one or four mice. The four mouse handler is, in, uh, is a holder that's in progress. The uh, other option is one rat. This is a heated, anesthetized chamber with video cam access for animal management purposes, finally controlled for progression through the PET, SPEC, and C C CT modal, um, modal subcompartments of the Albira. Now, the uh, in vivo extreme, center and to the right, um, the classic lab bench. MSFX Pro off to the left are our optical and X-ray imagers. What Bruker is really working towards right now is fusing the imaging modalities that these two image stations can already provide. Fusing the optical and X-ray of the Extreme with uh, the PET spec CT of the Albera. And we're really right on the cusp of doing this. We have a four mouse animal holder that uh, has been demonstrated in the Albira. And what we see here is an F18 uh, sodium fluoride uh, uh, tail vein injection labeling of four mice in a two by two matrix overlaid onto a CT image. like to progress through this. There we go. Okay, above and beyond the extreme in Albira image fusion, um, one additional um, modality fusion that we're aiming to achieve is that of MRI with Biospec. Getting uh, Albira PET and or spec images overlaid onto a Biospec MRI. Now, with a focus on the Albira, the next set of slides is going to present 
an array of applications that have been done by various investigators. This is looking at a uh, segmental analysis of a CT uh, following a tail vein injection of gold nanoparticles that enhance the uh, uh, density spectrum uh, of the mouse. And by that I mean you're able to highlight the vasculature in the abdominal, um, rib cage, and the carotid arteries. This is just an example of how CT alone can be used to provide um, fine-tuned anat an anatomical analysis of an animal in question. Um, this is the use of PET and CT together in the Albera to evaluate circadian rhythms in mice. And you can see uh, uh, the elevated signal of PET, FDG, uh, at the 18 hour um, Zeitbeer time point, which is 6 o'clock at night. The nocturnal aspect of mice um, supporting an elevated uh, activity at that, that time of day. And of course, all the data that you acquire through PET, one of its primary advantages as a 3D tomographic imager is that it's highly quantitative. So any individual mouse data uh, acquired over time can be presented as it is here. PET MRI imaging, again, is uh, useful not just for ordinary metabolic uh, function, but looking at various different disease case scenarios. This is looking uh, in particular at hypoxic lesions in the brain of a mouse using FMISO. The complementary image is down below, uh, looking at FD uptake in normal healthy cells in the same rat. Uh, another very um, well-studied example of uh, physiological abnormality is, is Alzheimer's, of course, with FDG uptake being reduced in the amyloid um, protein precursor phenotype versus that of the control. This is a neat example of using a uh, segmental analysis approach, again, just with CT to get at a fat uh, mouse phenotype and compare it with Go. Uh, the, 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 mat fat, uh, the, the fat mouse phenotype versus the ordinary lean mouse phenotype. So all of this, of course, again, can be quantified. We have uh, volumes of uh, 2 to 3 centimeter cubed versus 26 to 23 centimeter cubed in the fat phenotype. This is another example of indirectly uh, studying oncology um, through PET imaging where the lung volume notably declines over time as the tumor size progresses in the lung space. Again, this is just, um, just CT. Okay, so one of the things I, I want to address right now is what is it that is specific about the Albera that makes it a unique contributor to the PET spec CT imaging field? There are various attributes along with its architectural structure, its ease of use, compactability, and uh, very easy um, software template. But the thing that I want to focus on is the technology that really makes it a different player in the PET imaging uh, field. Okay, so standard conventional PET detectors are, sin are pixelated scintillation crystals packed together uh, in a construct designed basically to capture the annihilation photons as they get emitted from the animal, right? The 511, uh, 511 keV <coughs> photons hit the detector, scintillation cascade ensues, and that scintillation cascade is detected as in a form of energy, right? So the limitations of the current technology are that if you have events that hit the packing material, you don't detect it. Similarly, these 511 keV photons are very highly charged bits of matter. And they have the capability, more often than not, of penetrating one or more layers of packing material. So your resolution of your line of response is diminished, okay? So how does Albera PET detector technology address this? 
basically, we go from a pixelated scintillation crystal construct to a single Lysol crystal construct. in these crystals. So how does it actually solve the problems of uh, penetration through multiple pixelated scintillation crystals? And also there's a high versus low depth of interaction issue that happens in standard technology. Well, what, what really ensues is quite simple. In a single Lysol crystal, the uh, height of the interaction, sorry, the orientation of the interaction from center to left to right will be determined by the footprint that the uh, scintillation cascade leaves and is detected by the array of detectors around the edge of the Lysol crystal. If you have a center event, it's detected as a center footprint. Similarly, off to the side, the energy levels of the 64 array electrodes that read the energy levels off the scintillation crystal um, will uh, d determine a footprint being off to the side. And if you have a high or low um, point of interaction with the crystal, that will be interpreted by the software as a, um, through a large or small footprint. It's that simple and two very important um, resolution restrictions on most current PET detector systems is now resolved. I'm going to show you the two by two flyby again um, for the the specific point of having you look at the level of resolution across the four mice, uh, uh, you can, as a point of reference, check out the knees and the backbones. And you can see that in all instances, the resolution achieved and the intensity levels of the sodium fluoride are equal. Okay, this points to the fact that not only is your center field of view nicely resolved, as it is in most PET imagers, but the entire width your 10 and a half centimeter bore size of, uh, of the imager is available for use and gives you reproducible, uh, very exact um, uh, data. Okay, so we're going to switch gears now and focus on the in vivo extreme. The in vivo extreme, basically, as I mentioned at the outset, allows for four imaging modalities, fluorescence, uh, including a multispectral multi multiple excitation analysis technique, which I'll get into momentarily, radioisotopic imaging, luminescence, and x-ray. So we're going to just walk down through the various different parts of uh, the uh, in vivo extreme to show you how it's put together and how it works. Up at the top, we have an X-ray head, which is a 500 milliamp uh, X-ray source with a 45 kVp energy level, and a true microfocus, which prevents penumbra effect. So you have very good resolution of your X-ray throughout the X-ray region. This is the kind of X-ray, as a for instance, that you can get on our geometric magnification stage of a uh, mouse skull in a, in a matter of two seconds. You can get good resolution of knee joints. You can amplify those images, and you can see the inherent detail that's, uh, that's in, um, in the acquired image. Basically, any bone in the mouse's body is accessible um, through x-ray. Now, just below the x-ray head, we have an animal cabinet. This animal cabinet is where you would house the animals, of course. We have an anesthesia tray. Um, connected to ports that will allow hot air and anesthesia for the maintenance of the animal while it's being imaged. Underneath the tray uh, is a conversion screen. It's a, what we call an X-ray phosphor conversion screen. It will convert the X-ray that's passing through the animal into light, which then can be captured by the camera, which is right below the animal cabinet. Okay. Now, the camera itself is a 1.1, a very fast uh, f-stop camera with a cool CCD chip. It comes in two different forms, either uh, a high sensitivity 4 megapixel array for dark field imaging, luminescence, and radioisotopic, or a uh, high resolution format for x-ray uh, imaging in particular with a 16 megapixel uh, CCD uh, chip format. There are six uh, emission filters, 
that will filter out light coming from the animal prior to uh, its detection by the camera, which also allows you to gra greater specify what kind of light you want to see. And we provide six different fields of view, ranging from 19 centimeters square down to 7.2. The light source is located down at the base of the unit. Um, it's a 400 watt xenon illuminator with 28 specific uh, narrow bandpass filters that allow you to specifically choose your excitation light from uh, yeah. 410 up through uh, 760 nanometer. And these cartoons just go through the process of acquiring of how fluorescence is acquired. The key of wavelength uh, is that uh, if you use blue uh, light as an excitation wavelength, you can get a lot of confounding green emitted light from tissue autofluorescence, similarly with green and red uh, emitted light. And so I always recommend that for those that are working to develop uh, optical uh, systems or optical imaging systems that they use probes that excite in the near infrared, what we refer to as the optical window, north of 690 nanometer. In addition to a single excitation event, you can do multiple excitations to acquire an optical spectrum of a particular probe in the animal. And this allows you to use multiple probes in one animal at a given time, RFP in this case versus GFP. And this is another example. Each probe will have a specific profile that can be uniquely identified and recognized by the software and provide you a composite image of one, two or more probes with autofluorescence of the gut and the skin here being imaged both on reflectance and x-ray. Excuse me, Henry. Yes. Do you, you all have a booth? Yes, we do. Good, good. All right. Um, why don't you direct people to the booth and I've got to call up the next speaker. OK, very good. Um, I ran long. My apologies. I, can I end with one slide? This is just want to highlight the fact that we were here recently at Rutgers and uh, went ahead and did some uh, RFP and luminescence imaging on three mice um, uh, in a lung carcinoma model. You have individual x-ray and reflectance imaging along with RFP in the second row here showing this, the metastatic sites following lung challenge of the 549 RL carcinoma cell line. There's luciferase. And the final row shows RFP and luciferase together. You see nice co-localization of the luciferase and RFP expressing cell line. And that's a final summary picture showing the blasted away femur co-localizing with the luciferase signal and the METs also up in the ulna. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Andrew. Yes.